Welcome to Big Ten Icons, presented by Discover. This is a series of programs about the men and women of the Big Ten Conference, student athletes who have left their fingerprints on the athletic history of this storied conference. We call them Icon. Hello, everybody. My name is Keith Jackson. The exceptional people that we will honor were selected and ranked solely on their accomplishments during their collegiate years. No consideration given to what happened after they left the campus. So let us now have some fun exploring the exploits of these student athletes who have been voted Big Ten icons. This time out, we'll profile the man who helped put college football on the map. He's number one on our list of icons, the galloping ghost, Illinois' Red Grange. There are shapes now moving, two ghosts that drift and glide, and which of them to tackle, each rival must decide. They shift with spectral swiftness across the swarted range, and one of them's a shadow, and one of them is Grange. Those four couplets are the words of Grantland Rice, a sports writer moved to pen that prose after watching the greatest football player in Big Ten history and arguably in college football history, the galloping ghost, Illinois' Red Grange. There is no more revered figure in the University of Illinois uh, athletic history than Red Grange. His name will stand forever as, uh, as one of the giants of the, of, the, of the game and one of the giants of the athletics history and tradition at Illinois. I think Red Grange could, could easily be considered the most influential player to, to play in, in the history of the game. Harold Red Grange's path to college football royalty began in 1917 with a cool summer job in Wheaton, Illinois. At age 14, Red first went to work for the, for the Thompson Ice Company. My summer occupation, I was an ice man. Now, you youngsters, of course, don't know what an ice man is because you have electric refrigerators today, but the ice man used to haul ice, and we carried anywhere from 25 to 100 pounds to put in your refrigerator. And, of course, it helped develop him a great deal physically. The brute strength Grange built as the Wheaton Iceman helped make him a star high school athlete. In high school, I played four years of football, basketball, baseball, and track. I earned 16 letters. He was identified right away by coaches as someone with remarkable athletic skills. And uh, the skills were that he could really run. He was really fast in high school, and he scored um, a record-breaking number of touchdowns in high school in Wheaton. He was unbelievable. Despite scoring 75 touchdowns in high school on the gridiron, Grange caught the eye of Illinois football coach Robert Zupke at a track meet. Coach Zupke came up to him uh, between events and said, uh, hey kid, how would you like to come to uh, Illinois? He didn't offer him a scholarship. He simply said, I think you have a chance to make our football team. Grange arrived in Champaign in the fall of 1922 with no plans to play football. I was going out for basketball and baseball, the two sports that I liked the best at that time. My fraternity brothers decided I was going out for football. So they got the paddle down off the wall one day and said, you bend over. And I said, I'll go out for football, which I did. He came out first day, and this is just a 200 players out. And he's like, hey, I, they don't have room for me. They don't need me. He goes back to fraternity. And he told the upper class, but he said, well, I'll never make it, there's too many guys and nobody will notice me. And, and they said, wait a minute. And this time they really got the paddle off the wall. And if you've, any of you have been through that, you know what I'm talking about. They said, bend over and put your fingers around your ankles and uh, about two swats and I went back for football. <laughs> they made them go back the second day and get a uniform and then they began the, the history of uh, Red Raid. We 
When he joined the football team as a freshman in 1922, Red Grange was nowhere to be found on the Illinois depth chart. Grange was on the seventh, seventh string freshman team, if you can imagine this. They lined us up, about 90 of us, and said, now when we put the ball down, you run 50 yards. I won the first 50 yards, and then the assistant coach came over and he said, kid, what's your name? And I said, Grange, I'm from Wheaton. He said, never heard of either one of you. Grange needed only a few scrimmages to impress head coach Robert Zupke. Zupke quickly promoted him to the, to the third spring, and then they played a varsity freshman scrimmage, and uh, the varsity barely beat the freshman. He sees this guy running against his defense, ripping holes in him. It's like, oh my goodness, this is the guy from Wheaton who's going to be our greatest player ever. As a sophomore, Grange announced his arrival to the nation in stunning fashion, scoring three touchdowns in his first game against Nebraska. Overwhelming his foes with a running style yet to be witnessed by the nation. I think Red had the combination of speed and the elusiveness to be able to swivel, you know, hip swivel that, that made people miss. Football in the 20s was a different kind of game than today, and it was more of a defensive game. What made Red so sensational was the fact that he brought the offensive game to the surface. Coach Zupke's 1923 Illinois team finished the season undefeated and won a share of the national championship thanks to 723 rushing yards and 12 touchdowns from Grange, whose offensive brilliance made him a national phenomenon. We didn't have the television, we didn't have the exposure, so the print media was carrying it from East Coast to West Coast. Everybody wanted to see Red Grange. The sports writers in those days were more like poets than reporters. He became a hero for all of the uh, citizens of the state of Illinois, and uh, particularly in Champaign-Urbana. At the dawn of the 1924 season, Grange's junior year, one date on the calendar stood out, October 18. On that day, Illinois' new football stadium would be dedicated to Illini students and alumni who fought in World War I and the orange and blue would play host to the mighty Michigan men. In 1924, Illinois-Michigan game was heralded, especially in the Middle West, as the game of the year. To that point was the biggest game in the conference history. Thousands descended upon Champaign, Illinois to witness the dedication of Memorial Stadium. This huge brand new stadium that uh, on the prairie, you know, on a, on a town that had about 20,000 people, yet nearly 70,000 people showed up. A lot of the national writers had come into uh, Champaign-Urbana that particular day to cover him because they wanted to see this phenom that they'd only read about. The Michigan squad coached by George Little with former coach Fielding Yost serving as athletic director entered the contest riding a 20 game unbeaten streak having outscored their opponents 443 to 32 over that span and eager to settle a score. They were very jealous of the fact that in 23 that they were like runner-ups in the national polls and that really was a sore point because Michigan always thought they were better. Yost was talking about Grange all week. There will be 11 Michigan men looking for him to hit him clean and hard at all times. He knew about Grange, but he didn't think that they had enough other horses around him to beat this great Michigan team. It wasn't a question much by the reporters of who would win the game, and most of them, I think, 100% thought Michigan would defeat us. In the highly anticipated 1924 battle between Illinois and Michigan, the Wolverines elected to kick off. And college football hasn't been the same since. A lot of people weren't even in their seats yet. Red received the ball at a five yard line, started running, and he, he ran to the right, and then he uh, cut back to the left and, and broke loose and went down the eastern sidelines for 95 yards. 
Michigan kept kicking the ball off to Illinois, which was a rule at the time. If the team scores, you have the choice, do you want to receive the ball or do you want to kick off again? And Michigan, for some foolish reason, kept kicking off to Illinois. The second play after this, they gave the ball to him and he went, ran to the right, cut back to the left, and cut right through the Michigan team for 67 yards. It wasn't just a plunge in the lining, score from three yards out, it was rip down the field for 45 yards. It was break away, it was go left, then go right, then go left again. I mean, he was magical. Every player on that team, all 11 of us, did exactly what you were supposed to do. Everything worked to perfection. In the first 12 minutes, Red Grain scored four touchdowns, with each scoring play covering at least 44 yards. In less than a quarter, Grange had personally scored twice what Michigan had allowed over their past 10 games combined. Oh, much to the chagrin of Michigan Athletic Director Fielding Yost. The whole time Grange is going nuts on these guys. He's getting all upset, and his wife, a prim and proper lady, keeps on nudging him the entire game and says, this will not do, this will not do. After about the fourth <laughs> touchdown, she says, can't you stop him? The final score was Illinois 39, Michigan 14. Red grain statistics that day remain superhuman more than eight decades later. 212 yards rushing, 402 all-purpose yards, six touchdowns. For somebody to score over 30 points against Michigan in that era, you can look in, the, in, the, in their press guide and, and look for years and you won't find that many points scored against Michigan. This was 80 some years ago this happened. This was, this was before this should have happened. So I think best 12 minutes in history of sports. Michigan likes to say it creates legends. Sometimes those legends though aren't Michigan men. This one happened to be from the Fighting Line. Great for Illinois, a tough day for Michigan. Red Grange is truly an iconic player and we help make them that. They take no credit for it especially. I did what I was supposed to do. The other 10 fellas did what they were supposed to do. Who got the credit for it? Grange, because he carried the ball, of course. The other 10 fellas that made it possible. You can imagine what the locker room must have been like. He and his, one of his friends on the team were the last two guys out of there. They just quietly walked back to the fraternity. They changed clothes, went down to a local restaurant, just had dinner by themselves. That's the kind of guy he was. Grange may have been a humble superstar, but after his performance against Michigan, number 77 became a sports hero across the old USA. The University of Illinois was now in the national headlines because of Red Grange. A guy by the name of Grantland Rice, the great sports writer, picked up on him from the East Coast. He wrote the, this great five-line poem about Red Grange, and it was beautiful, and it, it sums up how important and how special the guy was. When they write poems about you, as an athlete, you're special. There aren't poems about Tom Brady. There aren't poems about uh, anybody. But there's a poem about Red Grange. Grange became known as the Galloping Ghost and drew offers from the floundering professional league known as the NFL. However, number 77 elected to return for his senior year in Champaign. But the Illini would struggle. They had lost a lot of players from the 23-24 teams. It was a green team, young team. Zupke was at a had lost what he was going to do, so he, he made red quarterback and captain of the team. Grange and the Illini lost three of their first four games before boarding an eastbound train to battle the Ivy League's Pennsylvania Quakers. It was billed as a championship between the East and the Midwest. The writers out of the East were saying, well, is, is, is Grange really for real? I mean, why can't he win? The Eastern writers didn't have the luxury of flying on airplanes at that point to see college football games. So this was their very first chance to see Red Grange in person. Historians often point to the uh, game against Michigan as Red Grange's greatest game. It really wasn't. It was the Penn game of 1925. 
On October 31, 1925, Red Grange and the Fighting Illini traveled to Philadelphia where the football pundits expected the one-man Illinois team to offer little resistance to the mighty Penn Quakers. Penn was undefeated, untied, and Illinois was one in three. So they thought, well, there's, there's no match. You're just gonna get smeared. Playing in ankle-deep mud, Grange sparkled in front of the East Coast press, single-handedly leading Illinois to a stunning 24-2 upset, rushing for a career-high 237 yards and accounting for 363 yards of total offense. This game was the game that made Red the top star because he took him apart and uh, it wasn't even very close. When they came back on the train, they met him all here at the Champagne Station, got red on their shoulders, and, and w walked him all the way back to the Zeta Sia house. The upset of Penn saved the Illini season. And the Orange and Blue, winning their next two games, set up a season-ending battle at Ohio State. Red knew it was his final game. He knew in the back of his mind that this would be the last time that he would be wearing a, uh, the uh, orange and blue uniform, and he wanted to make it a special date. Strange finished his college career in style, guiding the Illini to a 14-9 victory in front of over 70,000 spectators in Columbus. After the game, Grange almost didn't want to take his uniform off. He was so enveloped by the sense of what had happened during his days at Illinois, he almost didn't want it to end. And finally, they, he took his uniform off, and, and we've seen pictures of him looking at his famous number 77. And from what I am told, that was a natural scene. And it made uh, this lasting impression in our minds how much Illinois really meant to uh, Red Grange. Following the Ohio State game, Grange decided to leave school and signed with the Chicago Bears, immediately embarking on a coast-to-coast -coast tour that many credit with establishing the popularity of the NFL. Red Grange was highlighted as the star attraction. It really helped kind of build the NFL, uh, you know, got it started, got it off on the right foot, and really was the first I think real superstar of the NFL was Red Grange. Grange enjoyed a successful eight year professional career, but will always be remembered as college football's first and arguably greatest superstar. In just 20 games, wearing the orange and blue, Grange tallied 3,263 all-purpose yards. He scored a touchdown in 19 of 20 contests, finishing with 31 total touchdowns, nine of those covering more than 50 yards. Red Grange brought that attention to the university, and the university flourished because of Red Grange. More students came, more people gave money to the endowment of the university, and Red Grange have a lot to do with the growth of the university. He was a guy that probably every time somebody said, boy, Red, you're great, he probably said, oh, no, it's my lineman, or it's my quarterback, or it's, or it's my coaching. And that is a special quality. I never have accepted the fact that I'm a superstar. I don't really know what a superstar means. He was more proud of his career as an insurance salesman than he was in his career as the greatest tailback in college football history. Late in his insurance career, he's in his 50s or 60s, he goes to Chicago Bar. And this guy's going on and on about how Bronco Nagurski was not that great a player and blah, 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 blah. Bronco Nagurski was a teammate of Grange's with the Chicago Bears. And Grange said he's one of the best players I've ever, I've ever seen, one of the best guys I've ever met. And this guy's going on and on, and he finally says, well, who the hell are you? And Grange pulls out his business card, he's it face down on the bar, walks out. By the time he gets to the door, he turns around, and the guy sees the card, says, wow, I'm a jackass. <laughs> Looks back, Grange waves, and walks out. That's what a great guy Red Grange was. Red Grange passed away in 1991 at the age of 87. His famous number 77 is one of only two football jerseys retired by the University of Illinois, the other being Dick Butkus. 
And outside the stadium that Grange helped bring so much national acclaim to in 1924, a statue was placed commemorating the legend of the Galloping Ghost. I think that today's student, even though it's 90 years after he performed, still recognizes what Red Grange means to the University of Illinois through his prowess as a uh, football player, but more so his contributions to the university. I think that statue that they have of Red Grange on the 50-yard line on the west side uh, outside the stadium is a, just a magnificent statue. When you see that, there's a certain pride that it brings to Illinois people. He changed college football forever. It became more of an offensive game and uh, rather than a defensive game because of people who found a way to innovate and create, be more creative with their offenses. He is our greatest player, and he's uh, one of the most insp inspirational players that, that ever played here, and uh, getting close to 90 years after he played. And uh, no one's done certain things that he, he did. Red was a national figure on the stage of, of a Babe Ruth, that time of the great uh, athletes and names of the 1920s. Red really set the standard maybe as a iconic national superstar as a college athlete. I am awfully lucky to have had the opportunity to do what I have done. Where could you live to have a, a poor kid come up and play football and be known a little bit? And that's a great opportunity that everybody in this country has. To learn more about Red Grange and see the complete list of the top 50 icons in Big Ten history, visit BigTenIcons.com. For Icons, I'm Keith Jackson.